We are back in the book of Romans, chapter 12. We went through two entire verses last week, so um, I got very ambitious and think we're going to go to verse 21. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, I already know that. There are at least 32 points that I'm not going to make today. We're going to talk about the body of Christ, which you guys know is us, the people of God, as we gather together. And I'm excited as well. <laughs> because the body of Christ is you and me and how God works all of the pieces and the parts of who we are, all our various personalities, our little quirks, insanities, and our giftings, and works it together for the good of everyone, but also as a, a shining beacon to the world as to what it looks like to be the family of God. So... Great topic, way bigger than we're going to be able to cover today, so I'm going to do my best to get through the passage and get you out of here on time. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Romans 12.5 says, So we bring, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Did you ever think of yourself as being part of another person? Well, you are. You're part of another person. You're part of a, a group here. And when you're not here, you're missed. And when you are here, it's a good thing. So we're going to talk about what it is to be the body of Christ, just to remind you where we've been. We've been all the way through the book of Romans from chapter 1. This is basically the layout of it. And we are now in chapter 12, which is the church life. It, it's basically the application of everything in the previous 11 chapters, all of the deep theology and the the exegesis has paid off uh, all of the deep theological things that Paul's gone over, you know, the meat on the bone. He's now going to give us application, which is the, the hermeneutic, if, if you're a Bible scholar person. It's the application of everything that you see, the interpretation of it, and how do you actually put a handle on it and live it, which is really important because you can have a head full of knowledge and not know a thing about what it is, how it matters. So, uh, and I really enjoy this part because it has a lot of practical application for all of us. Just as a reminder, last week, we went over the first two verses of Romans. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And if you get a chance to do that this week, none of you. Wow, okay, I did. I woke up this morning. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or your reasonable service of worship. In verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So for us to understand the will of God, we have to, number one, have this transformation that takes place and then make sure that we're not being conformed or pressed into the world's mold. So I basically boiled it down to three things. You have to decide to die because if you're going to be a living sacrifice, you have to be dead because everything about our flesh, that which is connected to the world, wants us to do the wrong thing. I see something I want, I want to steal it. I see somebody I'm angry with, I want to smack them. I see somebody that cuts me off. I wish I had a James Bond vehicle with missiles. Yeah, I grew up on TV, so my mind goes crazy places. But I got to die to that. I can't do everything I want to do. I can't say all the things I want to say. I have to get over my fears. I have to get over my anxieties, my apprehension, my frustrations. I have to get over all that stuff, and I have to die to it and say, Lord, it's more important to do what you want me to do. You made me for you. So I've got to die to myself. That's what it is to be a living sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice unto God, but you're dead to your flesh. I might want to eat an entire pizza, but I don't do that because it's not good for me. In fact, I'm off all pizza. I, I still can't fit in a large shirt anymore, though. I had something wrong. It must not be the pizza. So you die, you have a funeral, you present yourself, your bodies, a living sacrifice unto the Lord. You say, I'm not going to do for me, I'm going to do for you, Lord. Number two, you resist conformity, knowing that the world is trying to press you into its mold. It's trying to convince you that you need to do what it tells you. 
You need to vote the way it tells you to vote. You need to spend your money the way it tells you to spend your money. You need to act and behave and talk to people the way they tell you to do it. I don't even need to tell you if you're aware of what's happening in the world. It's trying to press you into a mold. So you have to armor yourself up and be ready for that and know that peer pressure is definitely at work and certainly through the media trying to conform you to the image of this world. They want you to wear the clothes they wear and talk like they talk. And so what are you going to do about that? Well, you got to prepare for battle. You got to suit up and you have to be sensitive to that, that there are forces at work trying to manipulate you and press you into a particular mold. That's not what God would have us do. He wants us to die to ourselves and live for him. And number three, you got to transform to reform. You got to, you got to brainwash yourself. I don't mean brainwash yourself into something stupid and unreasonable. I mean, you need to wash your brain because your, your brain has all kinds of things lodged in it that cause you to act and will in ways that are not good. You know what I'm talking about? Any of you grow up with parents? <laughs> any of you develop some really bad habits or fall into some bad crowds or uh, any of that? Any of you watch way too much TV? You think life is really like Tom and Jerry and you can hit people with hammers? And... <laughs> There's a lot of brain damage out there. So there's a lot of undoing and there's a lot of mentality that we have to change. And there were things that maybe you grew up with. Maybe there were prejudices. Maybe there were influences on you that were not good. Lord, I'm going to be a living sacrifice. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to say what you want me to say. I want to be who you want me to be. And that's what it is. So I got to clean up my brain. And when my brain tells me, oh, this is how you handle something. If somebody hits you, you hit them back so hard, they'll never hit anyone ever again. That's not a biblical principle. So you see, I still have some cleaning up to do myself. So we talked about that last week. This week, Paul, right after writing this and saying that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and not be conformed to this world, he says, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy... Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Be of the same mind toward one another and do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, 
you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So you can see why that's rather ambitious to go over all of that today. We're not, there's at least 32 points I won't be making. <laughs> so let's go over verse at a time in case any of you are, are unclear. He begins by saying, for I say through the grace given to me, so he's speaking from an authoritative position. He says, you know, I'm an old man. I've been around the block. Let me just say a little something to you. To everyone who is among you, in other words, there's no one who's excluded from this, including you and I, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly, as God has dealt to each, each one a measure of faith. So we're supposed to think of ourselves soberly, which means making an honest, logical assessment of your abilities and your inabilities. How easy is that? Well, I have to go down the checklist for my own life. What is it I can do and what is it I can't do? On the long list of things I can't do, long distance running. <laughs> Any cardio whatsoever. And I know this because I locked myself out of the church yesterday. I saw something out the window and I said, what in the world is that? And I walked out the door and the door shut behind me and I was like, I didn't even have a jacket on. I didn't have my cell phone. And there's a combination in the door where there's a key, but I don't remember the combination. And so I'm outside like, what a fool am I? What am I going to do now? I look to our neighbors. They're not home. Car's gone. I have to remember my wife's phone number, which is sometimes difficult. I didn't have my cell phone. I was stuck. So I said, hmm. I started checking windows. I found one unlocked. So up on my tippy toes, I opened the screen, I opened a window, and the sill was this high. And I'm not much of a jumper. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I got in. Took me a little while. I got stuck in the window for a minute. <laughs> I was looking down at the floor and said, that's a long way to fall. 235 pounds to hit the ground, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I tried to get my legs in the window and they just wouldn't. I'm not flexible. That's also on my list of things I can't do. But I climbed up, got inside. And I said, that's it. I don't care what it looks like. I'm wearing my keys. Because I don't wear them in my pocket because you sit down and they, you know, they hurt you. But I'm going to hook them on my bell loop and I'm going to look like a janitor and I don't care. <laughs> Having an honest assessment of your abilities and your inabilities will help you not to do stupid things, right? But it will also help you to know what you're good at. Let me give you a word of advice. Sometimes asking other people's counsel in this is a good idea. Yes, ask someone else what you're good at and what you're not so good at. And you might be surprised, but make sure you have your catcher's mitt on because they might burn one over the plate and you'll get something you didn't expect. Uh, well, something else you're not good at is talking. Okay, you got any more? Oh, yeah, I got a whole list. All right, well, let me get a pen. Now, you know, If you want to make an honest assessment of what's going on, sometimes you need an outside point of view because it's very difficult for us to see ourselves accurately. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because it's a little like this. <laughs> most men tend to see themselves more buff in the mirror than they really are, and most women tend to see themselves a bit larger than they truly are. It ends up being the way it is. But... To properly assess yourself, you kind of need an outside opinion, right? That's why I hate stepping on a scale, because the scale tells me things that maybe I don't feel. The mirror may tell you things about how old you are, that your face, you just don't feel it on the inside, but the outside reveals that. And so it's important that you get yourself a good estimation of your abilities and your inabilities based upon what? As God has dealt to each one a level of faith. 
So he's going to talk about a spiritual thing here, not just a physical thing. But it, you know, you have to have confidence, but, you know, if you're going to go lift up, you know, 250 pounds, you can't have a physique like this. So you want to take a good, long set of a, a list of what you're good and what you're not so good at. And that's just so much fun. Everybody loves that kind of stuff. And then he goes into verse four, for as we have many members in one body, and he's talking about not church membership, he's talking about individual members like your hand, your arm, your leg, your foot. As we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, which is kind of weird to think about. I think of cousin it, you know, <laughs> thing. That's what a thing, it's just a hand, you know, so. If everybody did the same function, then we would all look the same, sound the same, have the same opinion about everything, and there'd be no need for most of us. They don't have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we belong to each other, each of us. That's why when things happen to you, I pray for you. When things are hurting with you, I pray for you, and, and you do for me when you know that there are things going on in my life because we're attached to each other, we're a family. We're the family you choose, not the one you get stuck with. I'm just trying, I'm just saying. In 1 Corinthians 12, if, you, if you're looking to talk about spiritual gifts, if you go to Ephesians 4, there's a list there. If you go to uh, Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, there are lists there. I don't wanna get too far off the mark because I wanna go over just the seven that are mentioned here today. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul reiterates what he's saying here. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the number one reason that God gives you gifts and abilities isn't for you. It's not like Christmas, where you get a Christmas gift and it's for you. You get a Christmas gift and it's for everybody else. It's kind of like when my wife gets me a circular saw. <laughs> she gets me a circular saw because she's got stuff she wants me to build. Or I buy her a vacuum, because there are things she needs to clean. So it's a little like that. God gives you a gift, but it's not for you. It's for the good of everyone else. So whatever it is that you have that God's called you to do, it has nothing to do with you aggrandizing yourself and looking like all that and something else. It's about giving it away. It's about being that for someone else. Because there are people that have need of what you are uniquely good at. So it is done for the profit of all. For no one is given the word of wisdom, I'm sorry, to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to other gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another differing kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So number one, the gift that you have that God has given to you is not for you. It's for everybody else. And number two, it's God who determines who you're going to be. It's not you. You say, well, I could be a much better worship leader if only I knew how to sing and play the guitar. <laughs> you, know, you don't just decide that you're going to go off and do stuff like that. So different but equally needed. You know, which part of your body would you like to do away with? Only the ones that are sick, right? Like if you got a, if you got a gallbladder problem or an appendix issue. But other than that, everything's pretty necessary, you know? And you want to hold on to it, keep all your original equipment. So in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, which is a very famous passage about love, and you might be familiar, it's actually more about spiritual gifts as opposed to love, which is rather interesting. You'll notice he says, though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and by the way, that's hyperbole, because you know what language angels speak? Whatever language you happen to be speaking because you wouldn't understand them. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, which is hyperbole, but I have not love, I become a resounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So it doesn't matter how gifted you are. If you don't have love, you're just a bunch of noise. Number two, although, and though I have the gift of prophecy 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. By the way, that's hyperbole as well. There's no one who understands all mysteries and all knowledge. You might have some knowledge. You might understand some mysteries, but not all. That too is hyperbole. And though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, it means literal mountains, like you, go away. But I have not love, I am nothing. So you can be gifted in all of these wonderful spiritual ways, but if you don't have love, it's really worthless. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, there's that giving gift, and though I give my body to be burned, so you're a martyr, but I do not, I have not love, it profits me nothing. The scripture is talking about being gifted and yet not having love because love is the most important ingredient. If you're gonna give anything to somebody, there's, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. There's a right motive for doing it and then there's a wrong motive for doing it, right? Oh, here I have a Christmas gift for you because you gave me one, so I feel I had to. Yeah, ooh, that people would be that honest. Wouldn't it be crushing? Oh, I bought this for you because you really need it. Oh, a toothbrush. <laughs> If you don't have love, it doesn't go down well, you know? It just doesn't. So this is actually speaking of spiritual gifts. The most important element in gifted service is an unconditional commitment to another's highest good. Another's highest good is another way of saying unconditional love. And it's not love like the squishy, kissy, huggy kind of love. It means I care more for your life and the importance of what's going on in your life than I do risking the fact that I'm gonna say something to you difficult and you might be angry with me. That too is love, very sacrificial. A commitment to another's highest good. This is achieved only when we are living sacrifices and not conformed to the world. So it's tying everything together as we move on through the scriptures. Verse six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And that just makes too much sense, right? How many of you would like to have a garage full of tools that you don't use? I, I kind of have that. The grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And by the way, just because the passage uses the word he doesn't mean that it's masculine. It can be anybody. It means you can substitute and put the word one in there if you wish, because this is male and female. God gifts along both lines, just so that you know. Motivational gifts. Motivational gifts are something that God builds into your life that's part of who you are. It's part of your personality. It's the way you see everything. It's a lens in which you see your entire world. That's a motivational gift. Then there are sign gifts, which are exterior, and they're to be a demonstration of God's power through those particular gifts. We looked at those when we were in Corinthians. And then you have offices, which God gifts and equips people to take particular offices. So without getting into all of it, we're going to talk about these seven motivational gifts, which it will be the way that you see everything through a particular lens. And I, I, I pretty am sure, pretty much sure every one of you has one of these seven. And not just that you have one gift, because as we mature in Christ, you notice you become a bit more well-balanced. And when I wasn't a giver before, and now I'm more of a giver. And when I wasn't such a truth teller before, because I was afraid of offending people, now I tell people the truth. I mix it with love all the time. And, you know, so you tend to grow in these things and God rounds you off. But there are things in which he has chosen you to be part of the body of Christ because you contribute something that no one else does. That make sense? Okay. First Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Because these are gifts that God gives, we have an obligation to use them, to be faithful to what God's called us to do, right? And we get to do that, and so we're encouraged to do so by Peter as well. I, I just want you to please notice 
these seven gifts that I have up here. This is just kind of the sampler platter. If you're interested in uh, anything more, I actually have a test that will be helpful for you if you want to discover what your spiritual gift is. If you don't know what it is that God has selected you for and gifted you with, it will help you to kind of sort it out. And it's a, a bit of a self-assessment so that you can think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the degree of faith that God's given to you. So we'll look at the sampler. I want you to notice three of them are about explaining the word. Explaining the word of God, prophecy, teaching, and exhortation. These are verbal gifts. It's about disseminating God's word and teaching it or handing it off to somebody else. I want you to notice the other four, ministry, giving, leading, and mercy. These are all things that expand the work of the kingdom of God. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Okay. Well, we're going to go through them one at a time. Prophecy. Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. What in the world does that mean? Well, prophecy, the original, the Greek word from the New Testament is prophetia, which is a, a discourse emanating from a divine inspiration in declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving or admonishing the wicked or con comforting the afflicted or revealing things hidden, and especially by foretelling future events. You guys are probably familiar with prophecy because the Old Testament is full of them about the Christ that would come, Jesus Christ, and how he would hang on a cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. It, it says that he would die on a cross, and yet he would be resurrected. So uh, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, my, one of my favorites. So you, you can look at that sort of prophecy, but if you look at the work of the prophets throughout the Old Testament, God gives them a word and they have to go give it, and very often it's bad news. Very often it's a finger in your face. If you think about Nathan the prophet, Nathan went to David and said, hey, David, I'm going to tell you a story. He tells him a story. And David said, well, the, this guy in the story deserves to die. And Nathan says, you're the man. Not like you the man. You're the man. You're the man in the story. And he told him, you, you went and slept with one of your men's wives you had him killed, and then you took her for your own, and now she's pregnant with a child. You're in deep trouble, David. And he disclosed it. It was suddenly opened up. Prophets are usually good at that, seeing things that are wrong. Of course, you can gain a reputation for that, and then no one wants to be with you. Because everything you say is you see something wrong. It's something messed up. So that ends up being one of the shortcomings, and that's why it's good to have the body of Christ, because if everybody did that, no one would be listening, everybody would be talking. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 5, it's always good to define a gift by what the Scripture says. It says here in 1 Corinthians 14, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God, and no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. There's your definition of what prophecy is. It's not, you know, thus saith the Lord. You're going to meet a dark, dark, dark stranger. It's not that. <laughs> he who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So the principle we learn is it's better to edify other people than just for yourself. Number two, if you're all speaking God's word to people, it's going to do things and it's going to reveal certain things in their heart and it's going to cause fruit and God, the Holy Spirit, will begin knocking on their heart's door. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 to 25 says, but if all if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, means comes into your church service, he is convinced by all and convicted by all. That's the fruit of a prophetic ministry. It brings conviction and a convincing. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Prophecy, when, there, when it's a gift and God is behind all of that, produces the fruit of somebody being convicted, 
I feel like I'm not the way I should be. And not a conviction that makes you want to go commit suicide, but a conviction that says, I, I'm just not right, and I need to get right with God. That's the fruit that's produced by the gift of prophecy. And so that's a, it's a great gift. In fact, he says, you know, instead of you all speaking in tongues, why don't you all prophesy to one another? And if you have an unbeliever that walks in, they won't think you're all crazy. They'll think that God is truly among you because the word of God strikes something in their heart that's relevant. Make sense? Good. It's about conviction. It's about bringing conviction to our hearts. It's about declaring the truth. That's what prophecy really is. So if you have some understanding that it's just about foretelling the future, then you only have a little, little piece of the, the, the iceberg there. <laughs> ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. By the way, I am not the minister here. We're all ministers. But this is the gift of ministry, which is the, some call it the gift of helps or of service. This is actually helping somebody, serving them. The original word is diakonia. Diakonia, diakonia, which is deacon, which is a table waiter, which is somebody that takes care of physical needs. So that's what ministering really is. It's, it's you know, would you like one of these puffs? <laughs> you've ever been to a wedding and you've been offered something like that? Can I interest you in a pig in a blanket? You know, that's really what it is. It's you coming up and serving. It's just flat out that. So in John 13, 12 to 17, this is where Jesus demonstrates this gift. So when he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and he sat down again. He said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, when they had the Last Supper, he went around and washed all of his disciples' feet, which were filthy dirty, from open toe shoes, walking on dirt-laden roads, with animals, dropping things at will. And it's usually the lowest servant's job to wash the feet of the people before you get to the table, because the table was like a coffee table, and you kind of sat sideways with your feet in your buddy's face. Jesus waited until after the meal, and nobody washed their feet, and nobody washed everyone else's feet. Jesus took off his clothes, and he went and washed their feet. That was him ministering to them. That was him serving them. And Peter, Peter knew who Jesus was, and he goes, you're not washing my feet. <laughs> I know who you are, and I, I should be washing your feet. I'm just a little slow at the draw here. He said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. He said, all right. A little strip down. You can walk, start from the top, work your way down. He's, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. That's the Jersey version. He says, you don't need to have your whole body washed, just your feet. And he says, and you're already clean by the word that I've spoken to you, but not all of you. So Jesus is trying to bring this physical act into the spiritual, and this is always a picture in a teaching moment. But Jesus stooped low to serve. Whether he was washing people's feet or whether he was feeding thousands of people. If you, if you remember, Joseph of Arimathea was told to carry Jesus' cross. He was ministering to Jesus by carrying his cross. And we're all told to pick up our cross and follow him, right? So ministering is taking care of the physical needs of somebody else. So if you remember Stephen, who was the first deacon, he was a servant. And their job was to make sure that these people who had gotten neglected in the body, that they had food and they were taken care of. And of course, because he was such a great preacher, uh, he ended up getting stoned. So here's a man who's deeply spiritual and he has a right uh, concept of who God is. And yet God has called him to be in the office of being a deacon. And so that was him celebrating that. It's about service. It's about support. It's about demonstrating the truth through doing not just speaking. And very often that makes a big impact, doesn't it? My wife has a habit of doing this. She'll see somebody's shoe untied 
and she'll say, excuse me, and she'll go right down to a knee and she'll start tying your shoe. Awkward. <laughs> because it's my shoe, I should have seen it. I could tie my own shoe. What am I, a little kid? What are you, my mommy? Kind of rises up. But she does it because she wants to serve. Amen. And she just does it naturally. Maybe it's from all the training with the two children, but she just does it naturally. She sees something, she takes care of it, she gets it done. I don't know that she's especially gifted in this way, but she does it naturally. And I think it's, uh, it, it's always good. So it's about service, it's about support. And do you see the love of God in that gift? Absolutely. Teaching. We want to exercise faith in our teaching. So what does that look like? Well, you guys know what a teacher is. If you were all forced to go to school, as our country says you must, to hold a discourse with others in order to instruct them, to deliver didactic course discourses, to impart instruction, to instill doctrine into one, to explain, to expound a thing. That's to teach. Hopefully I'm doing a little bit of that today. But I have to force myself to do it. It's not, not natural for me. Uh, I think I have the gift of sarcasm. That's about it. <laughs> This is about defining truth, and it's, about, and it's a very detailed thing, and you can see Jesus teaching all over the place, and you can see him exercising this gift everywhere. He goes up onto a mountain, and he begins to teach uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, probably the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached. Uh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed, you know, so he goes on to all of these things, and he teaches, and he goes on for three chapters teaching, and he's explaining, and he's going into details. And Jesus was great. He talked about salt and light. He says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden, so neither can you. You don't take a light and put it under a bushel or under your bed. You put it on a lampstand so it gives light to everyone. And he says, so you are the light of the world. Amen. He said, you're the light of the world. So our responsibility is to be on a lampstand and give light to everybody. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if it loses its flavor, it's not worth anything to be thrown on the ground and be trampled under the foot of men. Jesus talks about murder and adultery. You've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, it's just like you killed him. Because God sees and knows what's going on in the inside. He says, adultery, you've heard it said, those of old don't commit adultery, but I tell you, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you've already committed adultery. So Jesus is constantly taking these things that people may have an understanding and he's giving them a clearer and deeper picture of what's happening. He talks about going the second mile. If somebody strikes you on one cheek, give him the other also. If he wants you to go a mile, go with him a second time and you know, bless those who curse you. Jesus teaches all of this stuff and there's nobody else that teaches this. Jesus originated with all this. If your enemy smacks you, smack him twice as hard so he doesn't get back up. That's... That's what my dad taught me. <laughs> Love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. He talked about showing off. He says, whenever you do some kind of thing and you, you say you're doing it for God, a religious practice, don't let it be known to everybody. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when you're giving. And if you're praying, go into your closet, cl shut the door, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He says, don't stand on the street corners like the hypocrites do. And if you're going to fast, don't disfigure your face. And people go, hey, what's the matter? Nothing, I'm just fasting. <laughs> you're not doing that for God. Don't lie to yourself. You know, and so Jesus talks about doing all these things. He talks about prayer. He says, when you pray, pray in this way. He didn't say pray exactly these words repetitively over and over and over until you don't even understand what they mean. He says, pray in this way, our father, which means he's our father, who art in heaven, which means you're not going to meet him on a bus, <laughs> hallowed be your name. So you have to recognize who God is first, and then the rest follows. Jesus taught on how to pray. He taught about fasting and public prayer, which I already mentioned. He talked about hypocrisy, about being one way and really having something else going on underneath. He spoke about riches and about worry, and about how you're not supposed to do any of that, and about judging other people. And by the way, that's just two chapters that I just pulled titles off of in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was always teaching, no matter what he did. If it was healing, he was teaching. 
If he was making, you know, making bread and fish for people, he was in the midst of teaching. Everything he did was teaching. He used birds, flowers, coins, pearls, sheep. He used whatever those people understood, he drew it in and he taught them. And I love that about Jesus. He spoke to people right where they were. He was real. He didn't put a pre pretense on. He spoke in parables. He told stories. He said, hey, there was a guy and he had two sons and the one son just said, I want your money and he left. And Jesus tells stories and the people didn't understand what the heck he meant. But you know, when the spirit of God comes into your life and you begin to read these things, you go, oh, I get it. Because then... Then the Bible, which is a letter from God, is to you. Then it means something, because it's to you. Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler. I, I, the way he taught him was so great. The rich young ruler comes up, all shined up, you know, freshly showered, and says, Jesus, good teacher, what, what do we have to do to, to get to heaven? And he says, why do you call me good? Only God's good. See, he's given this guy an opportunity to be humble and say, you're not all that in a bag of chips, pal. I see right through it. But he says, okay, well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. He rattles off some of those. And he goes, oh, I've done all of those since I was young. <laughs> and it says in the book of Mark, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he told him, there's just one thing you lack. And I can see the guy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. This is it. Sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And it says he walked away sad. First time he was sad in the whole conversation because he had lots of stuff. Actually, the stuff had him. Yeah. Jesus knew exactly how to teach. He knew exactly what button to push. He knew exactly how to do it. And if you have the gift of teaching, you will do the same thing. You will expound on things and bring things out and God, and you'll love having 10 books open at one time and taking notes on everything and trying to jam everything into your brain. And then you will take three hours of a 45 minute passage to try to explain it to everyone else. So I will try not to do that. It's about information. It's about defining the truth. That's what a teacher is about. And that's what defines a teacher from, a, from somebody who has prophecy or a preacher my finger. <laughs> Exhorts, the gift of exhortation. It's to call to one side, to call to, to summon, to address, to speak to, to call upon. It's basically the same sort of word. We have the same root for the Holy Spirit, which is the paraclete who comes alongside. And he's kind of like our, our defense lawyer before the judge. And so that's what it means. It means to kind of come alongside and instruct and to encourage. And so it's not the hammer of prophecy and it's not the didactic of the teacher. It's more of a counseling gift, if you will. They come alongside and help you and it's done in counseling. In Luke, we see Jesus do this after his resurrection. He's walking on the road and he ends up catching up with a couple guys that are having a conversation on the road to Emmaus. And he says to them, what kind of conversation is it that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? <laughs> it's an interesting question. Then one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem or have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? Jesus is playing stupid. What things? He knows exactly what they're talking about, but he wants it in their own words. And isn't it good? Because now we have it written down. What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we are hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, 
I love this. Oh, foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. That is the gift of encouraging, to come alongside to reason with and to encourage. And it's funny because they said later, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke to us on the road? This is the gift of encouragement, to come alongside and to give someone courage. And people that are gifted at this, they just do this all the time. Jules Johnson is one of these guys. He's like, praise the Lord, brother. How are you? And like, he's always wanting to encourage people. And he's got a word. He knows the word of God and he's willing to bring it out. And I, I, could, I could point at other people, but Jules is big. He can handle this. It's about affirming. This is an affirming gift. It's about developing truth. It's about taking the truth and developing and massaging it to match whatever the situation is for the other person. It's very much a counseling gift. Giving. You guys know what giving is, right? You got something and you give it. Because you have two, right? No, no, that's not giving. It's to give over, to share it in one part. So when somebody gives, you guys know what giving is. It's part of our culture. It's not something I need to explain to you or show you the Greek word or even try to pronounce it. So giving. Some people are gifted with this. I can tell you there are some people in this church gifted with it because I've been a recipient. It made me cry. Somebody that has the gift of giving is about supporting other ministries, supporting other people. And you see the generous giving of somebody who has the gift of giving. Ephesians 4.28, we see Jesus had this gift. In Ephesians 4.28, let him who steals, who stole, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Notice, instead of stealing, manufacture and start giving it. It's a, it's a great way to not steal, give stuff away. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, so, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to import to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. You see, Paul was saying, listen, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, just give you, we didn't just give you a little. We gave you our whole selves. This is the gift of giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. In other words, you, you, you put a lot of seeds in the ground, you get a lot of corn. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Did you know God loves a cheerful giver? You know, instead of saying, let me see, I got $427 in my paycheck. So that's $42.70 for a tithe. Okay, here you go. Somebody with the gift of giving gives hilariously, actually, which is uh, what the word actually means. A, a cheerful giver, that word cheerful is the word where we get hilarious from. They're hilarious givers. Just saying. Acts 4, 32 and so on. Now, the multitudes of those who, be, who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked but all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. What a cool situation that is. This is the first century church. People come to Christ. They end up coming into Jerusalem for a festival and they said, we just heard about Jesus. We just got saved. 3,000 of us came to know Christ today. What are you gonna do? I'm going to stick around and get discipled. I want to find out more about Jesus. Well, where are we going to put them up? In our homes. And so they had to feed these people, take care of these people, and they adopted them into our homes. And so they said, well, where are we going to get money to feed all these people? Don't worry about it. We've got some extra stuff we can sell off, and we'll give it to the, the apostles, and they'll figure out where it's going to go because they know the needs. And so that's what they did. That's the gift of giving. Do you think that shows the love of God to people? I'll tell you it absolutely does. You know, I don't know if it's harder for you than it is for me to receive a gift, especially if it's financial. Like, wow, really? I just, I just feel like 
completely unworthy. But it, it's, I receive it from God through them. And there's a gracious way to do that. So don't let your pride get in the way, like me. It's about equipping. It's about equipping people with resources and doing it generously. And there are some people with this gift. It's stuff that we should all do, by the way. But some people are gifted at it. And usually the gift of giving comes with it, the gift of making. Because you can't have the gift of giving without having the gift of making. And it's usually people that know how to, to you know, make money or know how to work with their hands or know how to save money. And they have the ability to give. And what a blessing that gift is. Leading with diligence. To place before, to set over, to be, to superintend, to preside over, to be a protector or guardian, to give aid, to care for, to give attention to. This is somebody who is a manager. Some, of it call, some people call it the gift of administration. Some people uh, call it like an overseer gift. It is when you are able to look at a situation and you see the big picture and you say, hmm, I know what we need to do. We need to do this and this and this. And you know what? This is the best person for this. This is the best person for that. And this person can take care of that. And then it'll all be taken care of. And they see everything in a schematic and they see the future. They see all the little working parts and they know exactly how to make those things work together. And it's a gift. It's a gift. How many of you get lost when there's a big project and you go, I, I, I don't even know where to get started? There are people with the gift of leadership that will just take that and say, okay, what are our resources? What, are, what do we have to do? Rocco has this gift. Rocco's like, okay, we got to do this, this, and this. He sees the big picture. He knows all the various parts and he knows what everybody needs to do. Boom, 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 boom. It's a wonderful thing to see. That's the gift of leadership. Somebody that you like to be under. But you know, with every one of these gifts, there's always a weakness. You can find somebody that's very gifted in this, and if they don't add love, what happens? They always boss me around. Who do they think they are? Tell me what to do. Trust me. I've done it. So, Luke 9, 12 to 14, when the day began to wear away, the 12 came to him and said, send the multitude away that they may go to the surrounding towns in the country and lodge and get provisions. For we are a deserted place here. And by the way, it's been three days. These people followed Jesus for three days into the wilderness. They didn't bring any food. They had no lunch. He said to them, you give them something to eat. If you're so concerned about these people eating, why don't you give them something to eat? Jesus put, nailed them, right? What are you going to do about that? You give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. And there were about 5,000 men. Jesus said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. What? Jesus said, listen, if we're going to do this thing, we need to do it in an organized fashion. Have them sit down in groups of 50 or 100. That way there's aisles and we can get to them because I'm about to make a bunch of food and I didn't even tell you about that part. But you see, Jesus was taking leadership. People saw a need. Jesus said, you know, I have compassion on these people because they followed me for three days and they look like they're going to fall out and they look really hungry. And the disciples said as an answer, send them away. We don't want all these people here anyway. Just, just the 13 of us, right, Jesus? They did this all the time. Little kids came up. No, no, don't. you can't see the, the esteemed teacher. He said, let the little children come to me, such as the kingdom of God. The disciples are like you and me. So he says, have them sit down in 50s and 100s. You know, that's an organizational move. And Jesus, in the midst of trying to teach them something, said, well, why don't you give them some food? Sometimes you have to reveal the problem before you can show a solution, right? So Jesus put it on him. And of course, you got the guy with the abacus who's trying to add it all up. And he comes up with a number. It's, it's amazing. They're just like us. But somebody with the gift of leadership knows what's going on. Jesus said, hey, guys, we're going to go through Samaria. And the disciples said, what? No good Jewish person would ever go through Samaria. People get jumped, beat up, you know, left dead on the side of the road. Samaria is not a place you want to go. And Jesus said, I have a need to go to Samaria. They didn't know he had an appointment to meet a woman by a well. She didn't know it either. And he sat and spoke with her. That's a leadership move. When you tell a bunch of people, we're going to go do this thing. Or when you tell them, hey, we're going to go over to the other side. Jesus did that too. Okay, guys, let's pack up. We're going over to see a Galilee now. 
didn't work out well every single time because they ran into a storm. And Jesus was asleep. <laughs> they had to wake him up and said, don't you care if we're perishing? Jesus exercised this gift very, very well. Leadership. He also did it when he, when he finally got over to the other side of the, into the Gennesaret area. There was this crazy demoniac living in a cave and everybody knew about it. And so nobody ever went there. Jesus purposely said, we're going to the other side. He went to the other side, walked up the hill and here comes this crazy demoniac, no clothes on, remnants of chains on his arm, comes running after Jesus and the disciples presumably. And of course, they're probably all hiding behind him. And he said, who are you, Jesus, son of God? You know, come to torment us before the time. That's my demon voice. <laughs> and Jesus casts the demons out. The demons ask for special permission to be thrown into a thing of pigs, and so they do. And so this giant sty of pigs goes flying over the, the cliff and into the water, and they die. And the people who are watching the pigs are going, what? They walked up to Jesus and said, you got to get out of here. We can't afford for you to be here. You're going to kill everything. And the guy was so thankful, he wanted to follow Jesus. And he said, no, I want you to go home. And I want you to go home to your wife and your kids and show them that God showed mercy to you. Amen. Jesus practiced leadership. And he knew exactly what to do and where to go. And he knew what the big picture was. And he knew exactly how to do those things. It's about giving direction. It's about efficiency. It's about doing something better than maybe it's been done before. It's giving diligent direction. That's the gift of leadership. And God gives it to the body of Christ, and I'm so glad for that. This is the last one, guys, and I'm done. Mercy. The gift of mercy with cheerfulness. You guys know what the, mercy, you know what the gift of mercy looks like? Any of you here with the gift of mercy? You, you got to raise your hand. You got, Allison, you, Allison, really? <laughs> Some of you have the gift of mercy. You see somebody in trouble and your heart breaks for them. You literally carry the weight of their sorrows. That's the gift of mercy. It's not just being a, a, a bleeding heart. It means to carry it. And Jesus did this all the time. Luke 18, 38 says, and he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That was cried out to Jesus, calling him the son of David, recognizing him as the Messiah, and said, have mercy on me. You see blind people do it, people with leprosy, people who are lame. They cry out and ask for mercy. And you know what? Jesus has compassion on them. He has the gift of mercy. He doesn't say, huh, get a load of this. Ding, you're healed. You know, it, it wasn't like that. He had compassion on them and healed them because he cared. Matthew 20, 34, so Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Mark 1, 41, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And he was cleansed of his leprosy. Mark 6, 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. From a heart of mercy, a heart of compassion, Jesus reached out and supplied the thing that somebody need. That's the gift of mercy. And it's amazing. You can find these people in the church really easily. Just put your head in your hands and begin to cry. They'll swarm you. They'll be like, somebody's hurting. We gotta go check it out. Because they love to find out about what's wrong with you because they want to take it away from you. They want to bear it on their shoulders. They want to, Wendy, they just want to take your pain away. It's like they want to extract it from you and take it upon themselves. This is a gift. By the way, that's what Jesus did for us. He took away our sins. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. You remember the rich young ruler? And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack Go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He had compassion on him and said what he said to him because he loved him. 
Not because he was trying to zing it to him. <laughs> Watch this, this guy's going to run. He did it because he had compassion. He did it because he had love. It's about loving care for other people. It's about this cheerful compassion. And by the way, the admonition to those who have this gift is to be cheerful about it. Don't get all suicidal going and trying to lift the burdens from one another. Do it cheerfully because you have a God in heaven who hears and moves and changes things. So, as you can see, there's absolutely no way I was going to finish up to verse 21. So, there are 32 more points after this that I will not go into at this point in time. But if you guys want to read ahead, you'll find out that all of the rest of the passage begins to talk about those gifts in operation. And you can play this little thing where you take the verse and you apply it to one of those seven gifts. And it does. It matches with one of those seven gifts. When it shows about showing hospitality and giving to those in need, that's the gift of giving. When it talks about, you know, uh, abhorring that which is evil and clinging to the, that which is good, that's the prophet. You know, so there's, there are all of these different gifts and you can see where they match with those. So you could do the little matching game with the 32 little things to the end of the chapter. But I'm done. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. God has gifted his body with individual gifts. And every one of them is important. And so it's difficult when somebody leaves the body. Um, this Sunday is the Foxes last week. And they'll be going on to another church and exercising their gifts in that body. The Lord has led them to do that, and uh, they will surely be missed, Agnes. Even the kids. <laughs> we pray that the Lord bless you in your new venture and your new um, journey. Trust that he bless you. But we are a body, the body of Christ, and it's not just in this individual place. It's also universal. All those who've come before us and those who are, have yet to come to Christ are part of the family. We need to remember that and exercise the gifts that God's given to us for the common good. Amen.